House meeting to order. Take a roll call, please. Boren. Here. Falk. Is excused. Bowers? Here. Decker? Here. <clears throat> Hammond? Here. Hannah? Excused. Heideman? Excused. Pat? Here. Kittleson is here. Montemayor? Here. Aunt Rinfleisch? Here. Graisler? Here. Sampson? Here. Vanderweel? Excused. Versi? Excused. Ann Wangaman? Excused. Okay. Uh, quorum is, is present. Uh, there was some miscommunication via email today. Uh, the quorum is 50% plus one, so we need nine, which we do have a quorum this evening, so we can uh, enact business. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Looking for a motion to approve the previous minutes from November 17th. So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Discussion and possible action regarding revised design guidelines for the South Pier District. JJR, a Madison-based consulting firm, will provide a presentation and case studies related to the South Pier District. Chad, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, this is a kind of an ongoing planning process that uh, we use in the Department of City Development. Steve and myself, when we get interest for development on the South Pier District, and we all know that um, you know there's been some good projects. There's been a few not so good projects. Um, and these guidelines are really what kind of directs the developer uh, on the specifics of what we, are, we want this area to, to look like. And this actually came out of the 2003 uh, acquiring and development of that. And it's a, a document that's an ongoing usage document that we use in our, in our office to guide developers on what the vision is for that uh, district. <coughs> and the reason we've asked to come forward and do this is uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, we wanted to uh, make sure we're, we've got the most up-to-date current information for guiding development on the South Pier District. And number two, to provide an opportunity for new members of the council that maybe hadn't been involved in 2003 when this was uh, developed and find and kind of learn why stuff is laid out the way it is and what the vision was behind it and where, you know, where development will happen in the future. Um, so we've, we've contracted with JJR out of Madison, a consulting firm that de de developed the original uh, guidelines and regulating plan to help us update it. And through a number of meetings and comments, we, you know, and, and uh, existing conditions down there, we've, we've come to where we are today. So I'll be turning it over to Brian from JJR to give the presentation about the successes of South Pier District and where they, we see it going in the future, hopefully. Um, some of the types of businesses that we will be uh, looking for. Well, the other thing I wanted to say, we've invited members of the Architecture Review Board, the Redevelopment Authority, and the City Planning Commission to attend, and there are some in the audience. These are the, the uh, boards and committees that have direct impact on uh, what happens down there and approve or disapprove the developments. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Brian, and then after he's done with the presentation, We'll have a question and answer um, time if you guys got any specific questions about it. And then ultimately what we're looking for is a positive recommendation to the council, <coughs> the full council for adoption of this plan. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Chad, and, and thank you all. Uh, uh, it's, it's good to be here. Uh, JGR has been involved with this project for well over a decade, I believe. And um, to be uh, involved at this point to help it go through another phase of development and to kind of be able to fine tune things. Uh, we're very proud to, uh, to work with you uh, on this project. And uh, what I'd like to do tonight is um, talk a little bit, as Chad mentioned, about, about why this project uh, is the way that it is before we get into the regulated plan. And, and to, to sum up, um, 
just to sort of review for you some of the accolades. Right. Yeah. yeah. We'll need the. Oh, okay. Here. Um, Thank you. There. Is that better? <laughs> uh, and uh, ju just, it's interesting because we work on a lot of projects around uh, the Midwest and uh, on the lakes. And uh, this project is often um, used as a case study. And people talk about it and know about it. And, and so I wanted to end by just giving you some of the things that we hear about the project and why people think it's, it, it's worthy of visiting and worthy, worthy of studying. So with that, I'm blocking here. Now I'm squeezed. <laughs> Keep me from moving around too much. So uh, th this basically is, um, as I mentioned, um, I'll talk a little bit about the history, the, the regulating plan, and why we're doing it, and, and just generally what it's about without going into all the details. And then the idea of South Pier, which has become a model of success that a lot of communities look to. And back, back when this project was, was started, um, of course, there was a very different situation on the site. And uh, for the community, a real question of, of what to do with this land. Uh, like a lot of cities, uh, Sheboygan has uh, had a situation like this where uh, you had prime waterfront land that was used historically for industry uh, and other purposes. And uh, now with those functions leaving, the question is really what, what should be done with this? And it's a, it's a question that's answered differently in, in many communities. And um, right around the time that this was happening, it was clear that in, in a lot of cities that were dealing with this kind of issue, um, what was really replacing the city as the location of, the, of industry along the waterfront was um, a kind of place that really was uh, kind of an experiential uh, place. A lot of downtowns that are developing successfully are using their unique assets, whether it's culture, um, unique retail, uh, unique living um, opportunities. And, and what you have is already uh, a sense of kind of a fishing village and a marina. And there were things that were already sort of in the works. So the question was how to make this place something that was um, economically um, uh, of value to the city, but also fit in with the, the publicness of the waterfront and added um, a lot of new community uh, places to go to and, and things to experience on the waterfront. Great, thanks, Jen. And there was indeed quite a challenge and uh, um, there was a lot of work done uh, to improve the um, environmental conditions. There were a variety of funds used, uh, grants, and, and all kinds of mechanisms. Next, please. And I pulled this from um, back when and what the goals were, uh, to promote and protect public access to the water, uh, to stimulate reinvestment in the, in the central business district. The idea that, that this could be a catalyst to help the downtown and the community as a whole. Uh, to improve water-based recreational facilities and navigational access to the river, and to establish Sheboygan as a, a regional a waterfront destination. And destination, I think, is an important term. Um, it really uh, puts the place on the map. And build on the, the maritime identity of Sheboygan. Again, the idea of authenticity, not just doing cookie-cutter things, but trying to discover what's unique here and try to build to that. And to seek public and private opportunities and funding sources that minimize the negative impact on local taxpayers. Um, next, please, Chen. And the idea back uh, at that time, and I think it still uh, permeates through, is to look at creating a kind of waterfront village. And here are some um, ones that many people know about, Mackinac Island, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Fishtown, even Port Washington. And you know, none of those, you can't look at any of these and say, I see exact remnants and 
in pieces here, but there's a spirit of place here that is about a collection of a diverse group of uses, um, building styles, uh, and an emphasis on pedestrian quality, uh, history, and uh, that, and we think that's different than what you think of Waterfront Village in terms of uh, is it an except a section to a waterfront development, which implies a great big project. Um, so that was sort of some of the models that, that were being looked at at the time. Next. So this is the plan, and um, the plan was organized around a series of public streets, and the um, water's edge, probably the most important part is the river's edge with the river walk being totally open. Um, the way the plan was organized, if, if you look at it, is that almost every street leads to the water. And that's important in creating value on these building sites because you know, not everybody can be on the water. But if you walk out your door and you can look down the street in a block, half block away, you see water, it makes you feel like you are connected uh, to the amenity here. Uh, of course, the hotel resort is the large piece. Um, and uh, also a series of uh, public places, whether it's the, the river's edge, the, the lakefront, streets and sidewalks that allow this to be interconnected, which is another village-like uh, quality. This is the document that, um, that, that guided development. And uh, this is still um, the document that will be used. What we're doing is sort of looking at a particular area, the live work section, and adding a few more um, um, guidelines to it that reflect some of the lessons learned as we've gone along. And um, it's sort of a, a chance to fine tune and uh, provide a little bit more direction for this uh, sort of last piece of the development to, to be implemented. And in doing so, we, we wanted just to sort of document again the public places, and we think these are very important. Um, these are um, really the heart of the project, whether they are important streets that lead to the water, nodes along the, um, uh, the, the river walk, uh, you can see them very well, but like B and D are plazas at the end of streets that form focal points. Um, and then of course the edge and the differing conditions, river versus lake. Uh, e out at the very end, that was always envisioned as a kind of gathering place, um, watching fireworks, having festivals. And um, as we sat down and looked at the regulating plan for the live work area, we really wanted to keep in mind that we respect and make decisions that allow development to support this network. So uh, the regulating plan um, deals with the brown area there, the live work zone as it was called in the 2003 guidelines. And the reason uh, for the document is to ensure uh, quality and compatible development over time it, and to provide direction to developers, uh, staff, and citizens in evaluating the proposals as they come along to give direction but to allow some flexibility in, in achieving results. Um, and this is just a, a general uh, description of, of how the regulating plan works, but it's done according to streets. And there are three primary streets uh, that are involved with this zone, South Pier Drive, Lakeview Drive, and Blue Harbor Drive. And the idea is that uh, the guidelines deal with the character of each street. Each street has kind of a unique role. South Pier Drive is sort of the main street of the development, and um, it has the shanties on the, uh, the west side, and there, there's a, a pedestrian quality to it that um, is different uh, than one would uh, expect to find, say, on Lakeview Drive. So the guidelines uh, provide uh, direction for 
each of these different categories and there's a short paragraph and some text and in terms of building use the street activation that basically is how you deal with the uh, ground floor level to make it uh, interesting to pedestrians building placement and scale uh, where you put the building on the site uh, putting the buildings at the corners uh, where are entrances things like that uh, parking and vehicular circulation uh, service areas building heights and encroachments um, for this zone we looked also at the building types that would go along with these streets and the character that uh, was intended for them and what we have included here um, and this is uh, sort of a, re a, re a reflection of an, the need that's been discovered in some of the first projects to provide for what we're calling an enhanced shanty uh, as you may know along the the river itself the um, the intent is to have these small scale buildings uh, they're all kind of pointed ideally towards the water with spaces in between that echo what's going on on the other side of the river so that the river has this compatible kind of um, development on each side. Um, for the, the other side of Lakeview Drive, we're envisioning that we could have a slightly larger building and they could be up to three stories and uh, they might uh, all include offices. Uh, that was not really a part of the original uh, plan, but we think um, this gives you a zone there, the sort of the red uh, sh boxed areas that you can, if you get a project or someone that wants to do a larger building and wants to do office, you can still do residential and retail, but it gives a place that we think it's appropriate to put those. And then that will allow um, the, the riverfront area to be reserved more for the smaller scale, the buildings that really fit in with the kind of fishing village and um, um, pedestrian use and maximization of the of the water's edge. The idea is that there's parking uh, in the middle of the blocks that's similar to what the original plan was. And then along uh, Lakeview Drive and a portion of Blue Harbor, we're envisioning what we're calling residential rows. So those streets would be primarily uh, residential. And we're thinking uh, kind of a traditional townhouse um, or a walk-up corridor building, condos, that, that sort of thing. And these are some images that depict what that might be like. So again, what, it, what it's doing in terms of uh, making a change uh, is that it's creating a pop proper place for the slightly larger buildings that contain office uses. Um, the water's edge reserved for the smaller all retail shanty buildings. And there are guidelines uh, for these super shanties that um, ensure that they're still compatible with pedestrian um, qualities. For instance, uh, if you have offices on the ground floor, um, you don't want filing cabinets, storage, uh, those kinds of things right along the sidewalk where you have a lot of pedestrians. You'd want people to have either offices or entrance lobbies, things of that nature. So there are some guidelines that, that talk to those kinds of aspects of um, building use. It's really the use of the ground floor that is most critical in making these kinds of developments work. And, um, and just to step back and, and talk about this project and, and how others uh, talk about it. And uh, it, this was, I, we think we're, we're very happy to come and present this to you at this time because with the announcements last week and the, the sense that things are moving ahead, I, I think this is a good time to look at this um, pro, uh, plan and, and say, here's, you know, we're, this is the next phase. These are some guidelines to, to help it make it a success. But uh, to realize that um, we, when we go and work in other communities, uh, it's, it's, it's when you're in the trenches and you're here and there's ups and downs with projects, um, starts and stops. Um, but if, if from our perspective, we, we keep hearing people talk about 
we want to do what they did in Sheboygan. Um, I'm working in Oak Creek right now, and they have a 250-acre brownfield site on their waterfront, and they've sent uh, members of their um, building, uh, their advisory board up here um, to look at the plan. They, um, they, they know about um, the quality of the spaces, and, um, and we've worked in a lot of other communities that are that point to this and we just think you know it's um, from our perspective that you you may like to hear that <laughs> that that it's highly uh, regarded um, in in many circles and it's also won uh, numerous awards from the waterfront center the EPA Phoenix Award which they give those out every year and those are to the most uh, exemplary brownfield rec reclamation projects in the nation so there, it's a, it's a very extremely um, high award to get. Um, Milwaukee Real Estate Development Showcase Award and ASLA Wisconsin uh, has given it a planning honor award. And it's been a part of case studies which are when uh, projects are done elsewhere and they'll go and they'll do a bunch of research. Okay, what, why did this project work and what are the ingredients for success? And the AIA, um, RUDAT, that's the Art American Institute of Architects, their sort of urban design squad. Uh, they send people to different communities and at the Miami River, they just did a charrette where this project was featured. The Port of La Crosse is now looking at it. We're doing that project. Frankfort, Kentucky, Quad Cities, uh, Waterfront Center, Annual Awards, um, and others. And kind of the, the, the things that are talked about that, that people think um, that have been occurring here that, that they're trying to study and take out of it is, is summed up in these four words, holistic, quality, patience, and responsible. And holistic means thinking of the, the big picture, having um, an idea that is um, of the community, that thinks about uh, creating a place that isn't just about one thing but about many things. Um, quality is in terms of the, the details, and I, I think when one looks at what you've installed for the streetscape, the infrastructure, um, um, the, the buildings, it, it's all of a very high quality, and that's not always easy uh, to do or to ensure. Patience, this has been going on for a long time, and you have been able to keep the vision going and there have been a few hiccups and along the way, which is quite natural, but we try to tell communities that you need, you need to kind of keep the bar high and to try to uh, don't just accept anything that comes along, but try to work to find something and, and foster things that fit with the overall vision, which again is not always an easy thing to do in, in practice. And finally, responsible, I, I think it, it deals with a number of things. Uh, environmentally, it, it's the, the cleanup and the benefits that that has brought to the community. Uh, responsibility in terms of, of trying to promote um, um, value in the community in terms of, of economic development. And responsibility in terms of uh, the community, making sure that it isn't a gated private development, which I understand that way back there were some proposals that, that, that did that and that's what you often see in other places as, as an idea but having something that's available for, for everybody to use that you can, when your, your friends and, and, and relatives come from out of town, you drive them out on the end of that little circle and you can see the water along with the other um, uh, wonderful uh, places that you have here in the community. So, um, so that, that's kind of uh, taking you from the origins uh, of the project and bringing you through uh, to the current date. And so um, again, we're very pleased to be involved um, with, with this project and with you all. And uh, I guess we would entertain any questions or comments that you'd have. Are there any questions or comments from the committee? Alvin Morn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alvin Morn, if we could use the mic, we are televised again. Thank you. Sorry. 
how many condominiums are down there currently above the first floor buildings and what's the occupancy rate of the existing condos before we consider building any new ones? Chad. The uh, condo, the, the, the condo build, the Chad. buildings that have a condo. Could you grab the mic right in front of you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the buildings that have condos in them now are the uh, Altmeyer Shanty, where Trey Sheik is, um, and I believe there's half of those sold. Um, then there's where Popcorn Planet is. Um, some of, a majority of them have been in foreclosure. Um, they've been sold, uh, bought from the bank. So I think there's still a few units there that are vacant. Uh, the sea rice coal, the last I heard, three quarters of those were sold. And then you have the Blue Harbor condos that are part of the Blue Harbor right. development. Yeah, I understand. Those are rentals, though. Yeah, and, and I think the key here is, you know, this is, not per, this is not going down the route of maybe more condos as much as it's going down the route of rental housing and apartment market rate apartment houses for the young professionals um, to live and work in the area, in the downtown where people, where the young people want to be, the new generations want to be in the, in the center of the city. So we would look to the townhouses uh, development necessarily wouldn't be condoed as much as a rental unit, a higher quality rental unit. If I could just follow up. Please. Uh, now, I th if I remember correctly, Blue Harbor went online in about 2005 or was it 2006? 2003 or four? Well, when it, when, it, when it actually opened up? I think so. Okay. Uh, and then as the other buildings, peripheral buildings were built, including some of those condos you were talking about, some of those weren't completed until later, correct? Correct. And so the opportunity in a vibrant real estate market for those things to rent is at a very small window because the real estate market started to go down the tubes in late 2007 and early 2008, and it hasn't been very vibrant, especially for condo mortgages. It's harder to get a condo mortgage. Uh, so I'd be, uh, I'd be very reluctant to build any more housing down there until this thing turns around. If we can't even sell the ones that we have, and some of them that we have sold down there are now in foreclosure, I think we have to be very careful with housing as we go forward until this, this whole real estate thing turns around. I, I, if I may speak to a little bit on that. Uh, I've been in some of the condos, especially the ones over Popcorn Planet, uh, and it appears to me that the, the developments of those condos were really more for the uh, uh, tourism-based uh, to buy, to rent out, either in, you know, in the case of the Blue Harbor as a ho in the hotel pool, but other cases as investment properties. You know, you buy a condo, rent it out to, to people, uh, and you come through. Um, the, even the rice coal, um, very nice redevelopments, but the price-wise, they're not, as Chad was saying, really for the young urban professionals, the next generation. They're priced too high, quite frankly. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't mind necessarily seeing, you know, when people are looking at relocating here that don't necessarily want the yard for the dog and a sidewalk to mow, they want something that they can walk out, eat some fine foods, you know, go downtown, but it's affordable. We're not talking about um, um, subsidized housing. We're talking about areas where the, the new graduates from college who are working in, you know, in um, you know, lower management or something, who are single, uh, those kind of houses that uh, those current condos don't really speak to, I don't think. Correct, and, and there's some of us in the room that just participated uh, in a, a thing with the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation and young professionals from people from 18 to 40 years old, and they broke up ish. into, ish, <laughs> and they broke up into groups and talked about what the county needs, what the city needs, and the ongoing theme that I took out of that is that, the, that Sheboygan in particular has a lack of professional housing for the young people to live in the downtown. There's subsidized units, there's you know, the units above uh, existing retail establishments, but there's nothing new, loft type, trendy apartments. And Don was there, wouldn't you consider that that, that was mm -hmm. kind of the same theme across the 50 or 60 people that were in the room? There were several themes, but yeah, that was an overriding one that young people, again, the difference between baby boomers and, and Gen X, Gen Y is that they want to be more urban. They want to be close to where things are at. They're not looking to be out in suburbia. They want to be close to the action. Um, and I, I concur. I mean, I think what can be going down there? 
and just to be clear, there is, we're not discussing a plan. There is no development plan for someone to build condos right now. This is, we're looking at setting our, our master plan that if some, a development does want to come to the city, these are the kind of things we may be looking for. Uh, so I guess to speak to Alderman Bourne a little bit that there is no plan right now to build more condos. This, it may be a ways out before any an additional housing is planned. Alderman Hammond. Um, thank you. Uh, one of the things I appreciate from the plan is that the goal is to keep this area as public as possible. Um, and um, to give the citizens a, a varying of experiences. You go down there, there's retail, there's nice restaurants. Um, and I'd like to see that continue even with housing. Um, and. You know, I guess my second comment before my question is, we have a unique opportunity right now to really get this right um, and put some forethought. And as your patience comment um, exudes, you know, we have the chance to be patient and get this right. I guess a quick question, um, restrictive covenants. I didn't see anything in there about restrictive covenants. Do we have any, or maybe I missed it, but do we have specific restrictive covenants if they're building townhouses down there? You know, that they have to be so many square feet or they have to have X, Y, Z. Um. I think the um, covenants that you're speaking of are probably the design guidelines. Right. Um, which is um, the first part of what we dealt with and then a specific about the regulating plan as to locations of buildings. But there's no question in the different zones, the live work, the shanty areas, there are covenants that restrict uh, the type of development, whether it's the shanty, whether it's heights, whether it's building materials, where windows should be, what should be on ground levels, things of that nature. So I wouldn't say there's a restrictive covenant in terms of use, but there's a design guideline that will focus the type of uh, building development. Mm -hmm. As a follow up, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the reasons I mention that is I can't tell you, many people in this room can probably express the same sentiment. How many times people have driven down you know, South 7th or 7th Street towards Pent Air and commented on how nice that is that that's wide open now with Pent Air down. And I'd hate to give up that vista, um, you know, so I, uh, that was part of the reason I was asking, you know, or, uh, you know I don't sure. want to see another, at least I prefer not to see, um, I'm one of 16, but some kind of huge monstrosity of an apartment complex there that mm -hmm. really takes away from that vista coming down uh, South 7th. Right, and, and, and you raise an excellent point. I mean, one of the things we as staff and, and working with consultants and as well as the groups that are helping us with the architecture and the development proposals that are gonna be there as far as the approval process, everyone has an input from not just staff, but uh, the committees in terms of, hey, we wanna make sure we have these things. We, we like these guidelines because when someone comes in, we know in advance from you guys taking a look at this and approving it that we have a document to work with to say, hey, here are some important aspects that we believe should occur down at South Pier. Um, so we can use, utilize this document when people come in to say, hey, here's why we're keeping this view corridor. Here's why we're doing it this way. Um, you know, I guess the one example we have that's down there that we have uh, some, some uh, 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 comments and, and things we'd like to deal with is, is triple play. You know, there was a certain design. We found out the soils couldn't support the type of structure that was there. We wanted development. You know, that's the thing we need to be careful with from my perspective. We wanted development. We want development. But you have to be patient. You have to have the right type of development. Look at the development you have on the other side of the river. That didn't happen overnight. That was something that took a lot of time and effort and was not very pretty. But you look at it today and it's 24 uh, hours a day, seven days a week with the types of development you have on the existing shanty side. So I think it's real important not only on staff's end, but on the committees, on the citizens, and everyone's part to make sure we do this right. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can talk a little about uh, planned unit development. Yeah, um, the, the other aspect, and, and it would, would probably fall more into play with the plan unit development. Now, a lot of people are aware that we have just done the uh, Indiana, a little bit more focused. We've done the Harbor Center plan, and we, now we've done the focused on the Indiana Avenue revitalization plan, which speaks to development that could happen in Pentair and along Indiana. But specifically at the Pentair, it would be likely as a plan unit development. And with a plan unit development, you can uh, allow for different maybe variances and setbacks and types of things for superior design. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything we're looking at along the lakefront, uh, which is gonna be, you know, one of our key identities as Sheboygan, is gonna be utilizing this plan unit development to make sure that the design is always pedestrian friendly, fits down at the lake, gets us what we're after. 
So um, the plan unit development process is, a, is kind of a zoning step that comes to council. Um, and then the actual conditional use permit, which, which pretty much goes to our city Sheboygan Plan Commission and Architectural Review Board. And we feel that helps us as a staff have a little bit more control with what takes place down there. Not that we want to dictate everything, but we have one shot at this and we want to make sure we do it right. And getting at the comment about avoiding massive buildings, I, one thing that's sort of built into the guidelines is this idea that ideally you have a bunch of small individual buildings, but that's not always going to be the reality. So, you know, if you have a larger building, you, may, you break it down to look like it might be smaller buildings. Or in the case of the, of the, uh, for the super shanties, we're recommending that, you know, the gable end uh, sticks out and they can be linked mm -hmm. and form a longer building, but still as you go down the street, you kind of get the idea that you have this sort of 30 or you know, 40 or 50 foot module that reflects what's going on even if it if it isn't a larger building so what what i'd like to try to avoid is the whole you know you see everybody sees these you know three-story apartment complexes you know every university campus has them and yeah. just, just to throw something up there and block but your point's well taken mm -hmm. I, I think the other part about this is you know there's been requests that have come before the redevelopment authority that approves the ground leases and it's related to the office and you know that was one of the key things as um, some you know the original plan had retail along the riverfront and there's been requests and there's there's some office now that's been intermixed in the riverfront shanties and by doing up by changing this and you know really giving them another option they can put those offices across the street now th the people that are coming to us obviously have indicated well we want to be on the riverfront but really the whole goal was to have retail along the river and offices inland so the interior lots could be offices with you know some type of housing up above it with a mixed retail mixed use development so I think it gives us a little bit more flexibility as we move forward and and our entertaining development proposals are there any other questions from the committee how about our guests from the other committees? Is there any questions or input they'd like to add? Dean. Dave, yes? I'll repeat the question have, for you, Dave. The, um, the guidelines, the, the drawing for the, um, does it clearly include, the guidelines clearly include the former Kent Air site? No. So why is there a plan to incorporate that into the guidelines? For the folks at home, the questions regarding the guidelines and uh, does it include the Pentair site? The guideline, the, the Pentair site is, is under another planning document that we've enacted that the council approved, I believe, in January, the Indiana Avenue implementation plan. I think the biggest issue we have, the, the problem we have is we have a little bit more control over the land on South Pier because it is city or redevelopment authority owned. Pentair's property is owned by Pentair. And as Pentair comes forward, we'll have to entertain whatever their development proposal is. We've presented to them what we feel would be a good fit for this area, um, whether it's corporate headquarters, a large entertainment facility, you know, mixed use development, um, and been working very close with them on that. But I, they still have, you know, they're, they're gonna still come to us with some ultimate design plan because we don't own the property. So, you know, we have a little control here and, you know, we'll be working with Pentair, but to bring the Pentair into it, um, you know, it didn't, it didn't seem like it fit at this stage. All right, any other questions? Oh, go ahead, Dave. The second question is, is um, the, um, the guidelines, um, I don't know how to ask this question, to what extent did you look at successful development to know, um, are these guidelines based upon what we can go out and get real live developers to put down there? Because I agree it's successful mm -hmm. down there, Yes, but there's a lot of empty property down there. And some would argue a window of opportunity has passed us by when all those could have been filled in. And now we're going to really be facing a very tough time. So, I mean, to what extent are your proposals based upon other areas where they've been very successful or are being successful, and you know that this is what the public is clamoring for? Well, the, 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 the kind of model of what this is supposed to be is... Um, um, it's based on when you go to 
a lot of successful um, multi-use districts that are the they're they're oriented to streets. You know, the buildings are are built up to the sidewalk. It's sort of time honored urban design, I think, and uh, they're 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 sort of a distillation of um, what makes uh, these areas where you you have a number of different projects. Um, but you want them all to create a public place, which is the street. I think it's, it, this is based on the character of the street. And uh, a lot of those villages and developments that we think are successful, it, the, it, it's not so much uh, the buildings, but what they contribute to the, the public place. And so being based on streets by these frontage zone uh, notions are something that we've seen in um, a lot of other form-based codes that apply to successful um, developments. If I may uh, continue on that question, um, so the design obviously being more urban to the streets, you know, living in big cities where the hot dog vendors are, people sit and they chat or they talk on the street corners. Uh, but beyond that, is there call for office space that we don't have currently? Is there will that be successful? Is there a call for more retail, or should we look at some other direction on there besides retail? I think that, Dave, might be what you're getting at instead is, is beyond the plan of, of the design, the plan for what we actually would like to put in there, is, is, does that meet what is being successful out, out there so far? Well, the, it, it, there really isn't much that we allow certain uses, but it doesn't dictate or say that you should have X amount of them because that's really a function of the market. It really deals with sort of de developing what the, the character of the overall uh, place is, which we think is important, and you've already established, you know, it's sort of of this character. It, it doesn't look like a lot of other places, and so it's meant to ensure there's consistency so you don't get, um, you know, uh, suddenly uh, Alpine Village built uh, when you have this sort of shanty vernacular architecture. Alderman Kath, and then Thank I'll go you. back there, please. So if we're looking for um, long-term tenants, uh, urban design, would attached garages fit into this? You know, if we're looking for somebody who wants we, to live your we've, own. We've talked about that. I don't know that we would entertain garages right along South Pier, but Illinois Avenue, the street that used to be the access into the Pentair property, has a strip of land um, that would kind of warrant itself for having some type of garage as part of the development. So I think if, you know, if people would come forward and have a development that the garage isn't the prominent thing, you know, like where you'd see a three, uh, three car garage and that's all you would see was the garage. You know, if there was some type of inter, you know, inter gold uh, garage as part of it, I, I think we would definitely look at it and where the placement is so that it doesn't happen on some of these main frontage zones. Mm -hmm. And there are some precedents where you have a garage that, <clears throat> that is on the street, but it has a second floor where there's a, a bedroom, when there's a balcony or in, and a little cupola or something. So there's a way it, it could be dealt with if it's designed correctly. Okay, we'll go back there, please. No, it's this. This plan is more of a guideline and a regulating <coughs> plan. There is no, there is no actually adopted restrictive covenants at, you know, right now. We pretty much follow what's in the guidelines as the the covenants on the property, but there are no covenants that come with the development. That would come when there's a uh, developer. Yes, yes. Yeah, Alderman Hammond first, and then over here. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, open to any one of you guys. You know, one of my concerns always, again, going back to my point, is we have a chance to get this right. Um, green space. Um, is there in the guidelines or um, in the plans to ensure that there's green space for these developments? So we put these townhouses, condos, what have you there, that a place that they can congregate, that they can you know, have a sense of community on the South Pier? Um, is that built into this? Yeah, there are. In, in the public space diagram that we had, you know, it's mapping that those are not violated. Okay. Uh, there's also um, a connection through here. It's this space that now passes through the, the condos, and 
idea is that 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 pedestrian connection be respected when that's developed, whether it's a sidewalk or or whatever, so that that light green uh, that you see and then continues you know, through the middle of that southern portion uh, is there because what that does is it allows you to have a loop and you can walk along the whole edge, come along the, the lakefront, and then come back around. Having a, a, if you have a pedestrian oriented development, to have a route and sort of be able to come back again is, is, is important so that you don't kind of have a dead end. People like to be able to, sure. to kind of circulate around. So, uh, in that, all these areas, um, the guidelines are, are, are written so that um, the development addresses or enhances the, uh, what the public spaces are there. Yeah, and those, and those were, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do early on was to make sure those green spaces were available and how they all tied in. But it, again, if a developer came in and green space was part of, you know, the development, we would take a look at that and how it fits into the rest of the plan, you know, with walkways and pathway, pathways and green spaces. But the overall idea was to, first of all, dedicate what we have now with the original development so everyone knew where those green spaces were going to be and then as development occurred there could be some additional and again, just with the follow-up i mean i'm in favor of more green space especially down there uh, when you have again the public having access you've got the beautiful lakefront there you know to clutter with buildings that make any sense to me you know doing it wisely intelligently and having some green space you know like you do at the end up mm -hmm. in the purple around the roundabout up there um, circle up there um, makes a lot of sense to me um, and you know I would encourage us to take a look as a council and as a development at trying to incorporate as much of that as possible. One of the things we talked about was whether in some of those interior lots should just be left one or two of them should be left as is and it becomes a festival grounds area but the area on the end of the cul-de-sac is designated to have a a type of shelter for these festivals and that the festivals would happen would happen on that area mm -hmm. and the trails would connect into that for the pedestrians. So, you know, as we develop, we're gonna continue to use that as green space and maybe there'll be some more, you know, another update to this or an amendment to allow for that depending on what type of development and, moves and forward. The other thought we had about that too and the advantage of having it out there is that it brings customers by all the businesses back and forth to, to go out there, which you know, helps them get exposure as well. I can't argue the green point at all. Um, one of the common things we often hear is parking, you know, and so we gotta, you know, when we talk about the dedicated parking spaces, that's another tricky issue that we're dealing with with some of the businesses that are coming down there saying, hey, we need more parking, we need more parking. So it's gonna be something that we really need to, uh, the plan helps us out, but things that we continue to, to kind of uh, make sure that there's green space yet, uh, provide the parking and the other amenities that make those businesses successful as well. Alder Bowers? Yeah, question. Are there any uh, businesses that we would not allow in there, such as fast food? If, if they could meet the architectural, uh, uh, if they could meet the architectural designs, would we allow fast food restaurants in there? We, and, go ahead. And also, I, I, as I recall, a motel wanted to. Uh, um, Occupy space down there and that was turned down. Would we allow another motel down there if it met the criteria? And I guess that uh, That's about it Well, the you know the hotel I guess is you know kind of a touchy subject We'd have to definitely see I know that you know by one time Grand State was interested in Opening up down there and then there was you know some compromise with that so I you know I I think if that's the case, I don't know why a hotel would want to open up right next from a resort like that, but a competition might not be bad. I, I guess we'd have to look at that. The, we've never ruled out the fact that we franchise restaurants anywhere in the downtown could happen, and actually it's been a goal of mine to get a few more franchise-type fast food restaurants in the downtown, because I think there's a lot of people working in the downtown on the weekdays that have very limited spots to go mm -hmm. for a quick bite to eat. Um, we've heard this question on Indiana Avenue, the Pentair property, would, would we be against anything like that? And I think if they're willing to meet the design guidelines, we definitely would prove them. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing with regards to the hotel, 
Um, I think we have a significant investment in what's down there now, and so I think we just need to be very careful when we're uh, considering those options because we want to make sure what's there is going to be successful um, um, because it has an impact on the rest of the area down there. So it's uh, something that we want to be very careful with. Well, one more point. Uh, have anybody here ever uh, gone to uh, Lake Geneva? Lake Geneva has been a resort town for the last, uh, I would say, 100 years. And I haven't been there myself in the last 30 years, but has anybody looked at that? Because they're very successful. And uh, maybe we could uh, draw on their experience, what they've mm -hmm. done. Has anybody around here been to Lake well, Geneva? Absolutely. It, and I agree. And um, that draws people from, from everywhere. And um, it has a healthy business climate. In fact, it's so healthy that parking is an extreme problem, which um, we often think that when, when there's a parking problem, it's a good thing because it means people want to come there. But they may have it in an extreme. But I do think there's something about that place and the design that's very unique. And I think it is a very good model to look at as we think ahead, definitely. Alvin Sampson. Uh, thank you. Um, I just need to ask a pretty simple question here. I understand this is a presentation. Are we looking at doing something tonight? Are there decisions that we have to make tonight, or was this just more of a presentation to show us where we're at, what we need to look forward to in the future? What, what exactly are we looking for I think for what we're looking for is that it's a positive recommendation to the council, and then when we submit the resolution to the council, we'll attach a copy of the actual design guidelines, which is a lot of, this is a real simplified version of that. And if you wanted to go through and you know read through it on your own, you could definitely do that. So what we're looking for from this group is basically to kind of agree with our new approach and, and send a favorable recommendation to the council, um, to the full council for adoption of these guidelines as kind of the direction that we want to go in the future. To sum up, what you're looking for in terms of the different approach is those larger uh, live-work buildings, the super shanties, what you're talking about, which current design plan do not allow for. Is that correct? That is correct. So what they're looking for is approval to go to allow, within the design plan, lar those larger buildings, not on the, on the lake, but on the, the next tier between the lake and on the other side of the road. That's the difference right now. Is it looking for not specific to more condos, not specific to any one type of building, but more specific to the design of larger buildings in that aspect that we don't currently allow? So any other questions? Six o'clock. If any, any other questions, uh, I'll seek a motion for uh, exactly what Chad had said. Looking for uh, permission to uh, send a favorable recommendation to the council. Uh, and again, the, if, when it does come to council, we'll have more details. Yes. Uh, we'll have more detail before we final approval of the council. I'd make the motion, Mr. Chairman. Motion is made. Second. Motion made and second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Need a motion to adjourn? Thank you very much. Motion made. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you all for coming on Ash Wednesday. Uh, all in favor of the adjournment say aye. 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 A